Hey gang, it's Craig. Welcome to Between Light and Shadow, a Twilight Zone podcast. Uh, as I teased last week, we are not doing any episode analysis as we normally do. This week, I am presenting a very fun conversation I had a few months back with author Mark Dewidziak. He is the author of Everything I Need to Know I Learned in the Twilight Zone, A Fifth Dimension Guide to Life. If you've not read this book, you should smack yourself and immediately order it from Amazon or go to your local bookstore. It's absolutely worth having for any Twilight Zone fan. And honestly, even if you're not a Twilight Zone fan, though I would wonder why you're listening to this if you're not, it's a worthy read. Uh, like I said, it's a fun book. Mark is a great guy. He's a lot of fun to talk to. Like I said, this was recorded a few months ago. Um, it obviously took us a lot longer than we'd planned to come back for uh, this second series of episodes. Uh, so this interview was kind of a casualty of that. But now we're back on. Things are looking good. I am happy now to present my conversation with Mark Dewidziak, April 30th, 2017. Where are we? Right now you're in a kind of a limbo. You're neither here nor there. Where are we? Between light and shadow. So, Mark, welcome to Between Light and Shadow. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Um, right off the bat, I just wanted to congratulate you on the book. Um, everything I need to know I learned in the Twilight Zone. Um, listeners, if you have not checked this out yet, and by check out, I don't mean check it out from the library. I mean buy your own copy. Um, but you should. It's great. I had a blast reading it. Um, it's from what I've seen online, there have been lots of accolades thrown your way over the book. Um, I just wanted to start out by saying that I really love the casual conversational tone of it. It doesn't feel like you're talking down to me. It doesn't feel like you're necessarily educating me or um, it's just kind of like we're sitting on a couch having a beer talking about the Twilight Zone. Um I found myself nodding along a lot as I read it, as if it were a conversation. Um, and I even was tempted to respond, sometimes out loud, as I read it. Um, it's a fun read. Um, and I, I'm very happy I picked it up. Well, thank you. You know, that's the highest compliment you could have paid the book, because I really did set out to make it exactly that, which was conversational. Mm -hmm. uh, the tone of the book, as you know, is very much like talking to another fan, right. uh, sharing this passion and this enthusiasm for Rod Serling and the Twilight Zone. And so I didn't want it to come across as a, an intimidating book. I didn't want it to come off as a stuffy book. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I, I teach uh, uh, reviewing film and TV at Kent State University. And one of the things I, I try to instill in my students in their reviewing is to make their reviews conversational, as if they're mm -hmm actually talking to people instead of trying to sound important. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess I was trying to follow my own advice with this book, <laughs> uh, was to try to make it sound as, um, and, and, and this is what I, I've, I've, I really have made an effort to do that throughout my writing career, is that um, it, I, I, I can't use a word as grand as style to, uh, <laughs> to describe my writing. That's just too grandiose word mm -hmm. but if i were to try to put a, a a definition on my uh my writing especially my 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 newspaper writing and my current my reviewing I, i'd say it's the um the the leaning on the back fence school of reviewing or the <laughs> leaning on the bar school of reviewing as you will it is like we're having a conversation we're we're eye to eye nose to nose i be, I, I don't like critics who who look down on people mm -hmm. uh who 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 basically look feel like their their judgments are, are carved in stone right and that uh, people are too stupid to make up their own minds about these things like <laughs> sure. you know I, i've said this in the book and I've, i i don't have the, uh, the amount of hubris to say that 
these lessons are the only lessons you could derive from the Twilight Zone or even the right lessons. They're, the, they're my lessons. They're mm-hmm. what I got out of the Twilight Zone. And there is an unsaid part of the conversation to this book, which is what did you get out of it? Right. What, what, what did you see? Which, and that's what I really like about the guest lessons in the book. I, I, they were kind of an afterthought. But I thought, gee, wouldn't it be great to solicit? Um, I fell a little short. I, I wanted 50 guest lessons. That was mm-hmm. my, my goal. I, I, there, there's about 33 mm-hmm. guest lessons in the book. Um, I would have liked to have had 50, but mm-hmm. I ran out of time. Sure. But I really love the guest lessons that are, that are run throughout the book because they're other points of view. And uh, people found things that I wouldn't have found. And, and a perfect example of that is the invaders. Mm-hmm. The Invaders is obviously one of the great, iconic Twilight Zone episodes. A wonderful story by Richard Matheson. A wonderful experiment by the Twilight Zone to do a largely, uh, a largely eight episode without dialogue. And um, a wonderful performance by Agnes Moorhead. And one of the great payoffs in all of the Twilight Zones. Sure. I, for the life of me, could not think of a lesson to apply to that. What? Don't be stuck in, a, in an isolated farmhouse when there's an alien invasion. What, what is the lesson to be derived from from the invaders? Well, two of the people who I solicited guest lessons from, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson and David Bean Cooley, the TV historian, both went to the invaders and both came up with wonderful guest lessons. And it was a way of smuggling that episode into the book, which otherwise I might have I would have hated not to have had the invaders represented in the book in some way. Sure. So the guest lessons are also kind of a way of opening the book up and seeing just how many different viewpoints. You know, the Twilight Zone is like any great piece of art. Um, you get out of it what you bring to it. And I can only uh, take out of it what I bring to it. So uh, having all these other viewpoints really uh, enriches the book. Uh, at least for me it does. I sure. love having them. It also introduced me to uh, people I didn't know were Twilight Zone fans. Uh, the first guest lesson in the book is Mel Brooks, who is an immense Twilight Zone fan. Who knew? Who knew? You know, who knew? <laughs> but so so th- th- this is, um, th- th- that's a part of the book that, um, uh, but, I just, but yes, I, I, I think it, it, it is in no way, shape, or form an intimidating book. Sure. Um, and, and, I, and I did try to make it, like you could pick it up at any point, and it's like an ongoing conversation. I, I, I really, I'm tickled that you said that because that is what I was going for. That's great. Uh, it's funny um, participating in Twilight Zone fan groups on Facebook, and and seeing you know when people start to post, um, you know their favorite episodes, and um, so that's always interesting just to hear other points of view. Um, you know, I tend to be in my own little bubble. Um, I know what I like. I know what I don't like. Um, and sometimes it's a head scratcher. <laughs> what, what do you mean that's your favorite episode? I mean, I feel like if that's your favorite episode, you don't know what the Twilight Zone is. But uh, everybody's got a different story. Everybody comes at it from a different angle, a different point of view. Um, that's, and that's kind of the wonderful thing about the Twilight Zone is that, um, you know, as I discussed early in the book, what is the Twilight Zone? You know, there's some people who come at it and they're horror fans. Right. But The Twilight Zone clearly is not a horror series. At right. times it was. Sure. But it's it's clearly not a horror series. Thriller was the horror series, mm. at least at its best when Robert Block was writing the episodes. Right. right. Um, it's not a science fiction uh, show, although at times it mm. embraced science fiction. But right. clearly Outer Limits was the science fiction show. Mm-hmm. It's not a mystery show. You know, Alfred Hitchcock was the, right. was, was the mystery show. But it sort of embraces all of those things. Mm-hmm. Right. The, the greater genre of fantasy. But I guess the best way to define the Twilight Zone is just to cut right to the chase and say, define it for what it is. It's the Twilight Zone. Right. It's its own definition. Yeah, I think it certainly became that. And all these decades later, it's still that. You can say that to a person and they know exactly what you're talking about. Even if they're not familiar with the Twilight Zone, they know that it's it's representative of something strange, something otherworldly, something slightly askew so there are a lot of paths in mm-hmm. so, you know is that if you if you're a fan of certain things um well let's say you know uh just any one of the many incarnations of dracula sure you are probably coming at it as a horror fan mm-hmm. you know or at least a vampire fan of some kind sure um the twilight zone 
you, you, you don't have to be interested in any of those things. Mm-hmm. You could just be interested in good storytelling. Right. Uh, and you're going to, and you might be treated to a horror story. You might be treated to a science fiction story, but it doesn't really matter where you're, cu- you're coming from. There are many, many paths into the twilight zone yeah, and yeah. it, it, and, and, and it continues. I mean, it, the, the amazing thing for me is, is how those paths have not shut down. Right. Is that if you look at and you know, we're talking about a black and white show from nineteen fifty nine, Craig. Yeah, you know, we're talking about this is ancient history. Right. <laughs> this is I mean, what black and white T V show from nineteen fifty nine are people watching today? Nothing. Right. The answer's none. Right. You know, and, and I Love Lucy is probably the only other black and white show that continues to jump generationally. Mm-hmm. But otherwise everything around it is pretty much gone. And right. I get to test this twice a year with my students mm-hmm. at Kent State and ask them. And I have watched things disappear off the landscape that in 2009, maybe half the class knew Mayberry and had lived in Mayberry, America's hometown. Mm-hmm. Now, maybe one, right. maybe, you know, will know who Barney Fife is right. and will know what the Andy Griffith show is. Even Mayberry, which was, we all lived in Mayberry at one time or another. Mm-hmm. We all, that was all of our hometown. That, mm-hmm. for this generation, for the first time, is not true. Right. Which means, you know, that, that once again, you're watching very, very little. But they still know the Twilight Zone. Right. And they don't know just know it as a title. They know that the, the broken glasses, the gremlin on the wing, mm-hmm. they, they got it. <laughs> they they know the references. They know the the images of it. So... The wonderful thing is that those paths have not shut down. Right. Is that we're still talking. And, you know, yes, it helps that the Sci Fi Channel has a marathon twice a year. It helps that the Twilight Zone itself, as a phrase, has entered the lexicon. Right. That it is very, you you, you Google Twilight Zone for any given year, and it comes back, you know, hundreds of times in political columns, Mm -hmm. in, in commentary, in social commentary. It's a shorthand phrase that people use. Right. Uh, but there's that kind of recognition there. And for, for, for something black and white from 1959, that is really defying the odds. Exactly. I mean, if, if one thing can survive, I mean, I, I'm happy it's my favorite show <laughs> of all time. But, uh, but, <laughs> but it's also very sad. I mean, it, in my lifetime alone, and I'm, I'm in my late 40s now, when I was a kid, you know, I watched these shows. Uh, and this was before I found The Twilight Zone. I was watching shows from previous decades. My kids now, they they weren't they were nowhere to be found. You couldn't turn on. I, I mean, maybe there were channels that were you know retro nostalgia channels that were showing things, but the majority of it, it wasn't there. It's yeah, not there I'm, now. I'm sixty, you know, and I, and I don't hide my age because I've earned every year of it. Uh, <laughs> but um, but but in my uh, misspent youth, and I grew up in New York. The entertainment we were given was the our, of our parents, and in some cases, our grandparents. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was no Nickelodeon. There was no uh, Disney Channel. The, there was no specific entertainment mm-hmm. designed for us. Right. So they gave us the Little Rascals, mm-hmm. the Three Stooges, Abbott and Costello, Laurel and Hardy. It, that was what was programmed in the afternoons and after school for children's programming in New York. Right. And I consumed an awful lot of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you're absolutely right. The, the, there was almost a, 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 a non-stop flood of repeats mm-hmm. of TV shows one generation off. Yes, I Love Lucy, but also the Jack Benny show, mm-hmm. uh, Leave it to Beaver, Love That Bob. Uh, you were just constantly being, you know, and then the stuff you had watched was almost immediately then repeated, so it didn't go away. Uh, stuff like the Dick Van Dyke show okay. and, and the Andy Griffith show. And so you were constantly being reintroduced to it. And it gave us a common language. It gave us a common uh, reference point. And uh, when when we, we all do live in one hometown like Mayberry, it cuts across all all barriers, social, racial, economic, you name it. Everybody considered Mayberry their home. I grew up in New York. I mean, you know, what did I know about a small southern <laughs> North Carolina town? And yet I knew those people. 
and considered them neighbors. And I think, and too, that's the, gone. The less options that you have. You know, when I was a kid, we had four or five TV channels. So there weren't that many options. And I think there's a unifying quality to that, where it's like everyone's watching the same things. But now you've got 500 channels. You've got people streaming things on their phones. You've, you know, there's so many different sources of content. Absolutely. It's so fragmented now that it's hard to even find anything in common with another person. Uh, you know. Have, have, you, have you ever seen the play Inherit the Wind about the Scopes Monkey Trial? Sure. Well, there's a wonderful speech in which the, uh, the Clarence Darrow character uh, tells the jury that, you know, progress is never a bargain. You've got to pay for it. Right. And he tells them that I sometimes think there's a man behind a counter who says, you know, uh, sir, you, you may conquer the air, but the birds will lose their majesty and the sky will smell of gasoline. You may have a car, but you will lose the charm of distance. Oh. And you've always got to pay for the progress. And we gained a lot in the digital revolution and the cable revolution, the, the, the 80s leading into the 90s. We gained an awful lot. We gained choice. We gained a whole lot more voices. Mm -hmm. We gained a lot more diversity. But we did lose it, which is exactly what you're talking about. The notion that we all share uh, an experience, like Roots as a miniseries. Oh, sure. Where we all, it was transformative because we were all watching it. The phrase, everybody's watching it, doesn't have any meaning. Right. You could take the, the number one rated show of the last 10 years, of any of, of the last 10 years, and many people are watching it, which means 9 out of 10 people are not watching it, right. which means a hell of a lot more people are not watching the most watched thing on TV. And so we have lost this. There's, there's no question that the phrase everybody's watching it has not had any meaning since the mid 80s. Mm -hmm. And um, and that is a law. I, I, I agree because there is no chance for something to. The only time it really happens is where you get it happens once a year from a from a programming standpoint. That's the Super Bowl mm -hmm. when people not even interested in football are actually probably watching whether maybe they're there for the commercials or the halftime show or whatever they're there sure and uh and big news events but even big news events we're not only all watching the same source of news exactly <laughs> so i mean even there it, it is it is very fragmented uh, so yes, very filtered it, yeah. <laughs> but, but, political it is, but but I, I i agree totally it's a loss it, it, is. It, it is it is a great loss because everybody tends to go to their own corner of the pop culture now. And that's true of music. That's true of, of movies. That's true of everything. Yeah. Everybody sort of tends to go to their own little area. And so you don't and, – and, and this was the great thing. I mean one of the things that I grew up with was the variety show. Mm -hmm. And the variety show, we tend to take for granted. But the average variety show, like the 1960s, say the Ed Sullivan show, or even something as, as, as you know, tame as the Mike Douglas show, mm -hmm. what you had was a cross-section of musical forms, comedic forms. You know, Miles Davis might have been followed by uh, Stiller and followed by The Who, which would be followed by, you know, so you had all of these cultures, and, and it was all shared. It was like a big soup. Mm -hmm. That was all being crossed. So maybe you were being introduced to jazz. Maybe you were introduced to the blues. Maybe you saw Ray Charles on, on, on the Mike Douglas show or the Carol Burnett show or whatever. And it put your head on a swivel. Sure. You, you were looking. It didn't mean you were going to like everything, but you were being exposed to it all. And it was all, everybody was in the same place. Everybody was watching the Ed Sullivan show. So maybe... You got introduced to opera. Maybe you got introduced to ballet. Maybe you got introduced to jazz. Maybe you got introduced to rhythm and blues, country, whatever. It was all there. And so, and, and the past was there. Maybe uh, 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 Jim Morrison might be on the Ed Sullivan show, followed by Jimmy Durante. <laughs> well, so you were looking past. You're looking to the, to the comedy of the past at the same time you were looking at, towards the future. Right. And that really put that generation's head on a swivel. Now, everybody's just watching what of the moment. Mm -hmm. And they're not even carrying that onto this. Case in point, 
what group from the 90s tours? You know, I, I, up, hmm. to, uh, up to just a little while ago, the Eagles could tour. Up to a little, oh. the Rolling Stones still tour. You know, you look at, at, at groups from the last 20 years, they don't take the music with them. Right. They don't carry them on the way that, that, that previous generations did. Mm -hmm. So the music is very, very disposable now. Right. Uh, even more so than anything, you know. And uh, obviously, we're so far off the twilight zone now, it's not funny. <laughs> it's interesting. We, but, you know, on this podcast, we do that. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, I do that. I, I, I always tell my students, you have to put up with my rants. They're very entertaining, and they get off there, but, but you have to put up with them. <laughs> one, of, uh, one of my favorite books of all time, if not the my, the favorite book, uh, Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury. Yeah. And my teenage daughter just in the last few weeks had to read that for school. So we had some conversations about that. Did she like it? She not really. <laughs> my my yeah. daughter my daughter's tough, um, and uh, well, it's funny because and the, 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 this is, uh, the, okay. Here's another rant. Uh, <laughs> I would love to be in charge. I would love to be the czar in charge of giving uh, students books to read in the elementary and the, the junior high school and high school level. Mm -hmm. I could turn kids into uh, to readers. If you yeah. gave them the right book, Fahrenheit 451 is the wrong book. Now sure. teachers love it because it's like, oh, well, it's serious, it's all serious oh. things, but it's a little too serious. Yeah. And you know, and I've read just about everything that was that's been published on Ray Bradbury. Mm -hmm. But you know, if I were were going to, I'd I'd give them something wicked this way comes. Oh, okay. You know, and they like it for the mm -hmm. same reason that kids like Poe when they read Poe. You get Poe in the sixth, seventh grade. And teachers love reading Poe because it's about dismembering people and, and, and warming people up and, 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 and slapping them in torture chambers. It's just wonderful. It's wonderful stuff. You know, you have to give them the right things. Yeah. And boy, we, we're, we're a nation at great at giving people the wrong books at the wrong time. And it turns them off. It turns them off yeah. to, 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 to reading. You, you, Fahrenheit four five one should be the sixth or seventh Ray Bradbury book you read. It should not be the first. Yeah, you know, and 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 there's so much great stuff that Bradbury. I, you know, you can draw somebody in, but we're just great at giving people the wrong books, <laughs> and 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 subsequently turning them off to to reading instead of, of, of the opposite. So you know, th this is a pet peeve of mine as well. Yeah, and uh, you know, this is you, you you've seen Christmas Carol. Mo pulled out of curriculum in a lot of schools because, uh oh, Christmas is in the title. Well, you know, Christmas Carol is not the Billy Graham Crusade. It's right. a, it's a work of literature, <laughs> right. which Dickens wrote as uh, an attack on poverty. Right. And and it's a, and it's a great and teachers love teaching Christmas Carol because it's got ghosts in it. Mm -hmm. It's a very accessible book, and the kids already knew the story, whether through the Muppets or Mister Magoo or whatever. They know the story. <laughs> So what's the fallback position once you take out Christmas Carol? Either Tale of Two Cities or Great Expectations. Mm -hmm. And no, very few high school kids are ready for either of those yeah, books. Right. It's going to be a slog, and it's going to turn them against Dickens, and it's going to turn them against reading. Right. When you had a perfectly good book to begin with mm -hmm. to teach them. So anyway, sure. this is, with another rant. <laughs> um, what I was going to say is... Uh, we were talking about just how things are now being disposable, forgotten. Um, you know, my daughter is right in the middle of that. That is kind of her world right now is, is living in the moment. And part of Fahrenheit 451 addresses that, you know, everyone's living at full speed and they're, you know, uh, just trying to kind of have that conversation with her. It's like, this book is actually about you, believe it or not. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> And I'm not. I'm not trying to criticize you, but I want you to think about these things because because she will not listen to music from before her lifetime. She won't watch black and white at all. Um, and that was one of the things that hit me hardest with your book is is you're kind of chronicling your experience, exposing your daughter to this stuff. Um, and not just exposing her to it because it's something that you that you care about that you love, but it's like, look, this is literally a blueprint 
for life. There are so many lessons in this. I, I love that you framed it that way. And that really, for me, that had a lot of meaning um, because I have not, I have not been successful in that endeavor. <laughs> With you my know, own daughter. well, part of it is the light switch is I go, goes. I was, I talked to you know I had a conversation with Leonard Malton about this actually, mm-hmm. and because his daughter uh, loved and grew up loving uh, black and white stuff, and the thing the, the thing about it is, and 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 he 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 said the same thing you know and I've noticed this, you got to get them young, and when yeah. I say young, I'm talking about like five, six, seven years old. Mm-hmm. By the time you're getting into nine, ten. It's almost too late. Yeah. If you yeah. don't have them by then, you ain't got them. Uh, and and one is, it's like you know, my daughter. One of the things that that happened was, um, if you try to force it, it doesn't work. Right. If you try to say, oh, you you should watch this. Mm-hmm. Was the last thing you should ever say to kids. You know, my daughter found my old Laurel and Hardy tapes down in the basement. I had, a, I had a, almost a full collection of Laurel and Hardy's work, an old VHS tapes. Oh, wow. And she found them on her own, and she started watching them when she was quite small. And she loved them. Now, by the time you're 10 or 11, the comedy of Laurel and Hardy is going to seem way too slow and deliberate, and it's too late. Okay. It's almost like, you know... If a kid is raised bilingually and they start speaking a different language in the home when they're three, four, five, it's a natural thing. By the time they're ten or eleven, it's harder to learn the language. Sure. So if they if if, if they're starting, if you get them when they're like five, six, seven, they've been inoculated early. Uh-huh. Um, you know, I was just having this conversation with us with, with taking my reviewing class, and he said that you know he. Uh, he he just he just can't watch old comedy. When he says old comedy, he's talking about the early nineties <laughs> and and before you know, basically comedy that had a brain in its head mm. you know, before the Dumb and Dumber school yeah. took over. <laughs> and um, and and certainly he can't watch anything you know that was very very slow and deliberately paced like a lot of silent comedy. Sure. And um. I, I, I looked at him. I said, I hate to tell you this, but it's almost too late. <laughs> I don't know that you'll be able to make it. I, I just don't know if there's a way to get you. You know, right. I'll give you some films to watch. You know, watch Buster Keaton's The General. Mm-hmm. You know, if The General doesn't work on you, I'm afraid you're a lost cause. <laughs> you know, but I will give you some things to watch. It's odd. I can get them in other genres. You know, people say that I can't watch black and white. Oh, I hate black and white. I can get them. Mm. I'll, I'll show them the, the 1956 version of Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they'll go, oh, is there any more at home like you? You know, <laughs> exactly. oh, you know, that was great. What else have you got? Well, I got plenty. Yeah. You know, yeah. I can get you on genre. I can do that with the detective story. You know, I can show somebody the Maltese Falcon. Oh, sure. You know, you're losing there. You shadows here. Look at the storyline. You know, mm-hmm. no, the cow, well, the character. Comedy is different. Comedy is because there are rhythms involved and there's a certain speed involved and there's a language involved. And it is, is this class, my, my, my class is recently, they don't even know who the Marx Brothers are. And never mind never having seen a Marx Brothers film. They do not even know who they are. I mean, you might as well be talking about, you know, uh, you know, leaders of the uh, of the, of the communist revolution in, in Russia. You know, when you were referring to the Marx Brothers, so like, like, who? What are you talking about? So they're not even aware of them iconically, right? But if I showed them Duck Soup, I don't think they'd like it. I don't mm-hmm. think I, I don't think it would get through. Yeah. Um. And and so comedy is different. It's a it's a it's a just a different animal. But there are certain things. The good thing is there are ways to get. Um, people who are resistant to black and white in different genres, you know, right. and, and you can break through the resistance on some things. Um, I'm some, still ne- trying. Never gonna, some, some, it's just, it's never going to happen. Yeah. And that is sad. It's a loss. Yeah. Well, I, there is a ray of light. Uh, I have a, a new grandson, so <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to start working on him like now. <laughs> When he's three, start showing him Laurel and Hardy when he's like three or four. 
<laughs> and, and, and see if it works because you know that, that that's that's the age but uh, you know getting back to your point um you know other writers have said this is that um after you've you've written a book somebody points out something in the book and you go oh of course mm -hmm. but you weren't conscious of it while you were writing the book um and this has happened with a couple of interviews uh, with the book, you know, like Stephen King once pointed out that, you know, it, he, he once said, well, you're talking about the guy who wrote an entire book about addiction when he was in the throes of addiction mm -hmm. and didn't realize that's what The Shining was about. <laughs> and, you know, it, it, it sometimes it takes somebody else right. to to point something out. Well, I was doing an interview uh, after the book came out and somebody said, uh, I, what I really liked about this book is that it has a real father-daughter feel to it. Mm -hmm. And it, I, it took me, a, I, I, and I thought, well, of course it does. Well, sure. <laughs> but I wasn't conscious of it. <laughs> well, first off, you know, Anne Serling wrote the foreword to the book. Right. So it begins with the daughter. Mm -hmm. And the last thing in the book, the last lesson, is uh, taken from a speech that Rod Serling gave in Akron, Ohio, in 1971, so it begins with the daughter and it ends with the father. Mm -hmm. The book literally begins when I started sharing the Twilight Zone with my daughter Becky. Yeah. When uh, she was about 15 years old. And uh, so it literally begins with her. And then the la very last thing in the book actually is, is on the back is, is the author's photo, mm -hmm. which Becky took. <laughs> the book is dedicated to her. And she took the picture. And the picture was taken. You can't tell this from the book, the book cover, very closely cropped. But the full version of that picture, you could tell it was taken in Recreation Park in Binghamton, which is the park where Rod played as a little boy oh, when yeah, he was yeah. growing up in Binghamton. <laughs> so the book begins with the, and, and it, it ends with, 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 with Becky as well. So it began. In, and, you know, somebody had to point that out to me, that... This there is a real father daughter thing that runs throughout the book, and and there is, and uh, and and it came along as a natural thing, but I didn't articulate it to myself while I was mm -hmm. writing the book, and then after the book was actually done and published, and you know I was talking about it to somebody, they they pointed it out to me, and I said, well, yes, of course it does, right. um, but it's not something I would have said on my own, yeah, uh, until it was pointed out. That's that's fascinating because I mean my natural assumption was that that was by design. <laughs> no. It's a nice you happy know, accident. A lot of this book is I, I remember you know you can't give me credit for thinking too much you know uh, because I, I remember uh, interviewing uh, the actor Brian Dennehy once mm -hmm. and uh, asking him about uh, the fact that he was able to jump from Broadway plays like Long Day's Journey into Night, to um, movies, to television, and that he moved from one thing to the other. And I, I said something about, you know, uh, what his plan was as an actor, you know, how, what, what, the, what the grand design was. And he laughed. And I said, like, what's so funny? He said, well, that's like asking a man falling down a flight of stairs what his plan is. <laughs> I'm just going with it. <laughs> And that's kind of the way, you know, when the book was, was written, there are a lot of Twilight Zone moments. Everybody has Twilight Zone moments in their lives. We call them Twilight Zone moments. Sure. And a lot of them occurred during the writing of the book. And one other thing I learned very early was go with it. Go with the Twilight the, 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 the classic moment was the, the, uh, the chapter about the dogs. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, a, there's a chapter early on in the book about uh, the two episodes with dog heroes, The Hunt and Little Girl Lost. Mm -hmm. And um, I was sitting down to write that chapter on a very s bright, sunny Sunday morning. And I knew what I wanted to write. And if you, uh, you, what you have to realize is where I work in my office, the, the wall that you can't see is there's an oil painting of Rod Serling over oh. my desk oh, to wow. the left. And it was a gift from an artist in Tennessee, Drew White, who, was a, who knew of my great affection for Rod Serling, and he did it for me. And oh, so it's framed, and it sits over here. 
And uh, so I'm sitting down to write this chapter, and I pretty much know what I want to write. And all of a sudden, bam, 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 there's a, there's a knock on the front door, and I go down, and my neighbor, Brian, is standing there, and he's got a dog. <laughs> and he says, do you know who the dog belongs to? And I said, no, he's strange to me. And, he's, and Brian said, well, you know, it's all right. I can keep him in our backyard. We have a fenced-in backyard. I can keep him in the backyard, put some water out for him, and keep him for a little while. And I said, okay, well, good, good, because i got work to do. And I went back up, and I'm sitting down at my keyboard, and I'm staring in. And all of a sudden, I feel Rod Serling's eyes boring into me <laughs> because Rod loved dogs. Mm -hmm. You know anything about Rod Serling, you have to know that Rod adored dogs. And his daughter always talks about how Rod would – get down on the floor and play with them like a litter mate, mm -hmm. even if there was company around. And he just, they always had dogs and he just, he loved dogs. And there's some beautiful pictures of Rod with dogs. One of them's in the book. And I just feel this. And then all of a sudden, I, 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 I see this, the dog's face, you know, with the big soulful eyes looking like Max in, in How the Grinch Stole Christmas. And then, Rod's eyes and the dog's eyes are merging and I can't write. And I said, all right, all right, you know, let up on me. So I, I went downstairs. I got our spare leash. We have a dog, Tommy. And I got the spare leash and I went over to that store. I said to Brian, give me the dog. Because you know? the best way to find the owner of a lost dog is to walk your neighborhood. Right. Sooner or later, you're going to see a car. Going very very slowly down street to street, and uh, so I and I've done this many many times with lost dogs. So we start out. We've got two blocks, and here comes a car. You know, and I'm wave at the car. I say, "Come on, come on over here, over here." And the car pulls up, and there's two people inside looking worried, sick. And the dog jumps into the car, and the people are just uh, just oh, they're so happy. They've been reunited with their best friend. Now I go back and write. So I sit down and I start to write and I realize you are an idiot if you do not go with the Twilight Zone moment and make this the lead of the chapter. Right. Yes, what you thought was an intrusion was actually a gift. Mm -hmm. And that is, and as you know, that's how the chapter begins. Right. Is, is it begins with the story of the lost dog. And... That, that I, I learned to go with it is what I'm saying. You see, that wasn't – if I had gone with design, <laughs> I would have – it would have probably been a much more boring chapter. But mm -hmm. now I, I, I went and I just wrote it the way it happened. Mm -hmm. And that's where kind of the conversational tone came from. Yeah. Was, you know, just sort of saying, okay, don't throw out the, you know – the, the the stuff and go with 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 where where your instincts are go go with where your passion is in this and that more or less you know usually put me on the right path but there were several twilight zone moments during the, the the writing of this book and and i embraced them i just i just embraced them and then after it was done i sort of looked back on it and went oh yeah that's right you know that's how that happened sure um in the book you make frequent references uh to Mark Twain. And I don't think that you, you mentioned it in the book, but the episode of stop at Willoughby has a really great Twain reference. Um, James Daly, James Daly's wife is berating him. And she says it's her mistake that she married a man whose goal in life is to be Huckleberry Finn. And I understand that you are a student of Twain every bit as much as you are a student of Rod Serling. So well, maybe probably more so. <laughs> really? Well, tell me a little bit about that. Um, well, your your audience can't see me, but you can. I can. <laughs> and uh, uh, I've I've been playing Mark Twain on stage since 1979, mm -hmm. and uh, and Hal Holbrook is a dear friend. I, I I would not step foot on stage as Mark Twain without his knowledge and permission, because mm -hmm. he showed us all how to do it. Uh, so, uh, but I've been a, a student of Mark Twain, a serious student of Mark Twain since high school mm -hmm. and five of my books are on Mark Twain. So, you know, if, if you look at my extraordinarily schizophrenic resume, <laughs> you'll see a lot of Mark Twain represented there. And I guess that's one of the things that, uh, uh appeal to me. You're, there are a lot of references to Mark Twain in the book, 
but the one that matters, the one that counts, is the uh, the parallel to Rod Serling, mm -hmm. which is you know the the profile on on Rod in the book is called uh, Marlis in disguise, mm -hmm. and that phrase comes from Mark Twain, right. and it comes from a letter, which uh, Mark Twain in his you know his prime was was primarily known as a humorist right. and a funny man. And a little girl in France had sent him a letter, and she had said that, uh, you know, that behind all of the joking, I sense uh, some serious ideas. And Twain sent her back a letter in which he, he essentially said, shh, <laughs> you've got it, you've got it, but don't tell anybody, don't tell you know, anybody. you're right, I'm a moralist in disguise. And that phrase is, is there a better phrase to describe Rod Serling? Basically, what Twain did with humor, Rod Serling did with The Twilight Zone. Mm -hmm. So how he created The Twilight Zone was that, you know, he had had, I love that the, 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 people love to, to quote and misquote the F. Scott Fitzgerald line about there being no second acts in American lives. Well, of course, there are second acts all the time. You know, we're, we're a nation of second acts. We love second acts. We love second and third acts. And The Twilight Zone was the second act for Rod Serling. Mm -hmm. You know, he had already established himself as one of the great writers of the live anthology shows of the 1950s. He and Patty Shayefsky were probably the two best known writers, star writers from that era. Mm -hmm. But you know, in the beginning of the 50s, television was sort of the Wild West. They were writing it as they they went. They were making up their own rules. Mm -hmm. By the end of the 50s, TV was becoming very, very corporately driven. Right. And it became a medium of you can't do this and you can't do that. It became a medium of rules. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't do this because the sponsor may not like that. You can't do that because maybe... Uh, the southern stations won't like that. Uh, and you can't do that because it might offend somebody. And Rod was getting increasingly frustrated with getting the message across. So he created the Twilight Zone, mm -hmm. thinking that if I hide all of the messages with metaphors and basically hide this all with aliens and spaceships and such, Nobody's going to raise an eyebrow, and I'm going to be saying the exact same things I was saying <laughs> with the live anthology dramas. And that's ex precisely what he did. He was a moralist in disguise, the way Twain was. And he got the message across, and he reached an immense audience, and he showed the way for generations to follow. Right away, Roddenberry picks up on what Serling does with Star Trek. You know, it's that uh, Twilight Zone goes off the air in 64, and Star Trek starts in 66. And Roddenberry admitted he got it from Surly, which is that if I take all of these messages, put them on a, a starship, and send it out to Alpha Centauri, I can say whatever I want about war and prejudice and mm -hmm. hatred and all of these things. And he did. And, 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 and the Twilight Zone had shown the way for that. But I think that that's the, one of the great things that Serling had in common with Mark Twain besides having an, an immense social conscience, he also knew that you couldn't preach at people. Mm -hmm. You had to get the lesson across in some way, that they would listen to it, and that it would be effective. And so what Twain did with humor and satire, uh, Serling does with fantasy in the Twilight Zone. And I, so, so I think that that's one of the reasons, you know, in truth, I was drawn to the Twilight Zone before I was drawn to Mark Twain. Mm -hmm. Um... I was drawn to the Twilight Zone when I was nine years old, not in its original run. Um, the Twilight Zone, I was born in 1956, and it was immediately, when the Twilight Zone went off the air, it was immediately started to be repeated in New York mm -hmm. on WPIX Channel 11. And so I was about nine or ten, and I was watching it in reruns. Mm -hmm. But what attracted me to it was what would attract any nine-year-old to the Twilight Zone. It was spooky. Right. <laughs> you got to the end, and you had that wonderful creep-out feeling that from the ironic endings, and, and that's what you wanted. That's what I kept going back. 
I didn't know from metaphor. I didn't know from social conscience or what kind of messages were, were in there. You know, but as I got older and I was, you'd watch these things again and again, you start to be aware that there are morals in mm -hmm. almost every single episode of The Twilight Zone. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I actually discovered Rod Serling in The Twilight Zone First, I really didn't start reading Mark Twain until I was in high school. I mean, I, was, I knew who Mark Twain was. I'd been exposed to him in the sense of knowing the stories like The Prince and the Pauper and Tom Sawyer. But I really didn't start reading Mark Twain uh, in, a, in a serious way until high school. And then I started reading everything. Yeah. And then I started you know, performing as Twain. And, uh, and ever since then, I mean, I, I lecture as Twain. I do, you know, talks. I do academic papers. I, you know, but, but again, five of my books are on Mark Twain. But if, you know, plans had worked out, I would have written a Twilight Zone book before I had written <laughs> It Didn't Work Out. <laughs> yeah, I wanted uh, to touch on that a little bit, actually. <laughs> since, since I, 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 I remark on this in the book is the fact that the dream of my youth was to write a history of the Twilight Zone. Mm -hmm. and uh, I was working in a, a, a small newspaper early in my career in uh, Upper East Tennessee, Kingsport, Tennessee. And I set out, you know, in my mind to write a history of the Twilight Zone. In truth, I was pretending to do it. Um, East Tennessee is not the best base of operations for writing a Twilight Zone book. <laughs> but in fa point of fact, uh, Several interviews came my way. Donna Douglas, for instance, came to town during that time. She was filming a TV commercial for uh, Trailer Homes. And I ran down to the, uh, the filming site and I interviewed Donna Douglas about working in the Twilight Zone. I was writing uh, my what then was my first book was A History of the Barter Theater, one of the great original regional theaters in Abingdon, Virginia. And I had interviewed two uh, people who had gotten their start at the barter who had been on the Twilight Zone, Fritz Weaver. And Claude Aikens. Oh, okay. So I had some, I mean, I was, you know, actually had some interviews, enough to fool myself into thinking that I, I would actually be the person to write this book. <laughs> and this was the early 1980s. And, well, you know what happened. You know, <laughs> 1982, I walked into a bookstore in uh, Kingsport, Tennessee, and there sat Mark Scott Secrees, the Twilight Zone <laughs> companion. And, um, I can't say that he beat me to it because I hadn't even really gotten started. Right. And I can't also say that I was, could, was, was angry about it because Mark did such a splendid job with that book right. that uh, I knew there was no way I could have done anything near the impressive amount of work that Mark did. Um, it's, it's pioneering work. Mm -hmm. um, and he got to a lot of people who otherwise would not be on the record about the Twilight Zone. Sure. So that book... Uh, to me, it set the standard for what a study of a TV series should be. Really uh, launched a whole genre. Um, well, and being a practical person, I immediately set my sights on my second favorite TV show. <laughs> and I wrote a book about the Columbo series <laughs> called The Columbo File, which was published in 1989 by Warner Books. And... My goal in writing The Columbo File was to write as good a book on the Columbo series that Mark has done on The Twilight Zone. Mm -hmm. You know, to me, he set the bar, and I needed to either equal or surpass that mm -hmm. with what I was going to do on The Columbo book. Right. So I, I really, you know, dug in and did it. And that book was published in 1989. And that book led to a publisher called me, a small publisher in New York called me when that book was published and said, I love your, your Columbo book. I said, well, thank you. I'm fond of it too. <laughs> and uh, he said, uh, have you ever thought of doing a, a same type of book on the Night Stalker? And I said, oh, I love the Night Stalker. I just didn't know that there was a publisher crazy enough to publish a book like that. And he said, well, I'm crazy enough to publish it. So I said, uh, well, let me see if the, the people who are, would, would want to be cooperate with it. And, you know, so I wrote a, a, a book about uh, the history of the Night Stalker series. Mm -hmm. And that sort of put my foot into genre, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and then the creator of the Night Stalker asked me to write the first original Kolshak novel in 20 years, which I did. 
which was called Grave Secrets, and it was published in 94. And then I revised that book. And in between, I had published my first Mark Twain book in, in uh, 1996. So here we go. This is a very circuitous route. It was sort of, I didn't know it at the time, but I was working my way back to the Twilight Zone. You know, so all now, you know, I'm writing a fair number of books on, on genre subjects. I'm editing books by Richard Matheson uh, for Richard. Um, got to know him very, very well. For a while, Ray Bradbury and I were writing, we're working on a book together. Uh, you know, all of these riches come my way. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and book after book follows. And... Um, then I start sharing the Twilight Zone with my daughter. And we get to that episode, Escape Clause, that's early in the first season. And uh, the one with David Wayne, who makes the deal with the devil and signs the contract and for immortality. And we all know it's not going to end well for David Wayne. <laughs> and when the episode was over, I turned to Becky, my daughter, and I shook my finger at her and said, now let that be a lesson to you. Always look through contracts. Don't sign anything about knowing what's in them. And, you know, I was joking, but then I kind of... People had signed bad contracts during the housing crisis, not knowing what they had signed, how much trouble that got us into. Mm-hmm. So I, I turned back to her and said, like, no, really, I'm serious about this. So uh, this became a running gag after every Twilight Zone <laughs> episode. I would turn to Becky and say, let that be a lesson to you. Because <laughs> I can run a gag into the ground with the best of them. And we got, uh, you know... It took me. I'm a slow learner. It took a few weeks before the penny dropped, and I realized, you know, there might be a book in this. <laughs> and just because I think so doesn't mean there is. But in the back of my mind, I'm also thinking, I'm owed a Twilight Zone book. <laughs> so I, you know, I, I called my agent and said, you know, I've been kicking around this idea. Well, she loved it. She loved the idea. And then, you know, she, she took it to uh, St. Martin's, and they loved the idea. So, you know, and we had a book, you know, so... It, 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 I went all the way around to get back to the Twilight Zone. Is basically what what this is all about. Because you know, there, there's a something happened during the the, uh, the book, and that is, um, I had already read proof the proofs on the book. So you know, I said, okay, the book is the book. I know what it is. I know what, what it looks like. Mm-hmm. And um, I was talking to my friend uh, David Dean Cooley, who. Uh, gave the guest lesson for the invaders mm-hmm. and David said um, are you going to have an also buy page in the book and you know the also buy page is that page that's in the, the beginning of a book that's, that, that show the, the previous books written by the author oh sure you know now I haven't had an also buy page since my fourth book uh, which was 94 and so you know it just never worked out for design you know mm-hmm. so I, I've been sort of like waiting, like, you know, like, when am I going to get my, my next also buy page, you know? And I said to David, no, you know, I read proofs. It's not, a, it's not in the book. I said, so I guess I'm not going to get my also buy page. And the next day, St. Martin's called and said, oh, oh, we need you to send the titles for your also buy page. <laughs> my also buy page. Hey, you know, and the reason I, I'm bringing this up is that if you look at the also buy page in this book, it's the most schizophrenic thing you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> it's, it's a little bit of everything. Uh, there are the five books about Mark Twain on there. There's books on TV history, like the Columbo file and the Night Stalker companion. There are books. Uh, there's a book about Dracula. Mm-hmm. There's a literary biography. There's stuff. There's horror. It's all over the map. You know, and somebody asked me who, 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 about that, said, you know, I don't get it. What's, wh- what's the common theme? And I said, me, me, I'm the common theme. You know, this is all stuff I'm interested in. In fact, my next book's going to be on Theodore Roosevelt, sticking with this, you know, <laughs> jumping around thing. I, 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 I don't like repeating myself. I don't, you know, I, I, I always look like, for New York I, I follow my, my, my passions, and I have to have a lot of them. So... You know, it, it, it is, you know, I, I, and I'm always going to go back to probably genre stuff. I'm always going to go back to Mark Twain probably. But I'm always also got my eye open for other things and, and, and other projects and, and how 
but but that's part of you know one of the early lessons in the book is to follow your passions is to to, to follow the things that fire you up um i suppose you could say like if i could stick to one thing i'd be successful you know um but i i just you know i i i just have this 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 need to to follow what what interests me at the moment mm-hmm. and uh, you know i i, I talked to bill nolan at william f nolan about this mm. and i know bill feels that he would have been more successful if he had stuck to one thing mm. you know that he was right there with the though that that the the writers who were known as the group right you know and, and ray bradbury was their mentor but you know it was richard matheson and charles beaumont and 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 Bill Nolan was right in there with them, and I think he feels that had he just done horror, he might have been like Stephen King, or if he had just done science fiction. And you know, it's it's a it's 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 a moot point because Bill had to write what he had to write. You know, things pick you, not the other way around, and and they come in their own time. So Bill's written biographies, he's written mystery, he's written science fiction, he's written horror. He's written. He's written on things on auto racing. He's he's done. His resume is is also it's it's very wide, and I think you know we have a hard time with that in this country. We have a hard time with understanding and rewarding versatility. We love specialists. Mm-hmm. You see this in movie directors. Oh, sure. you know, we love Alfred Hitchcock because he was a thriller director. You know, he directed suspense. Thriller, so we could sort of get our put the tag on it, right? You know, we don't think as much of Robert Wise. Mm. Why not? <laughs> you put Robert Wise's resume together, and he's as good as anybody. Yeah, he just happened to work in a lot of different genres. Right. All right, he did musicals. Well, the two musicals are West Side Story and Sound of Music. Right. <laughs> okay, he also did horror. Yeah, two of the horrors are The Body Snatcher and The Haunting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he did science fiction. The science fiction is the day the Earth stood still, mm-hmm. and he—it's like the setup. And and somebody up there likes me. And he did action, and he did all of these. I mean, why is his credits? You put them all together. Why isn't that more impressive? Right. Than somebody who is just a specialist. You know, Howard Hawks was the same way. But you know, we love our. You know, so you know. It, it's easy to see who Stephen King is. It's mm-hmm. easy to sort of get your mind wrapped around Stephen King. Mm-hmm. It's harder when somebody is going, and, and this, is a, this is completely a 20th century conceit, by the way. You know, before that, somebody like Robert Louis Stevenson, he was a writer. Yeah, he wrote some of the greatest horror of all class, including The Body Snatcher, including Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. But he also wrote adventure stories like Treasure Island and Kidnapped. Mm-hmm. He also wrote poetry. He also wrote essays. He wrote all, and he it it he it didn't stop him to go. Well, I'm a horror writer, right? Or I'm a thriller writer, or I'm you know he just wrote what what interested, and and nobody else did either. They just mm-hmm. considered him a writer. We now love to put tags on people, mm-hmm. and I think that that's you know, and and some of that has hurt, you know, Rod Serling's reputation. Sure. Is I think that some people tend to look at Rod Serling and forget to look at the totality of the writer. Uh-huh. And when you look at the totality of the writer, it's incredibly impressive. Right. And there are works of Rod Serling. There are people who know Rod Serling's work on The Twilight Zone through and through, word for word, or know his work, but they've never seen Requiem for a Heavyweight, uh-huh. which is one of the great American dramas of all time. Agreed. And probably his greatest work, yeah. where they've never seen patterns. Uh-huh. They don't even know what Velvet Alley is. And Velvet Alley is an amazing, amazing Playhouse 90 drama with uh-huh. Art Carney as a struggling writer and Jack Klugman as his agent. Right. And he's struggling, struggling, and Jack Klugman stays with him and stays with him. And all of a sudden, he catches fire and becomes the hottest writer in Hollywood. It's an amazing piece it's an amazing drama, and he wrote it right before the Twilight Zone. And people don't even know it. Right. Uh, so, you know, I think some of that, 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 that tagging hurt Rod Serling a little bit because he really was an amazing writer. But yeah. to really see, you know, the Twilight Zone's enough. 
Sure. <laughs> it's enough to hang your hat on. But I'd love for people to know the totality mm -hmm. of what a terrific writer he was. Um, I wanted to back up just a bit um, with Mark Scott Zickery's book. Um, having read your book, I can honestly say that it's a worthy companion to the companion. Um, I mean, they're very different books. Um, yeah. you know, yours I could explore. not tread the same ground that Mark, <laughs> or, or Martin, Martin Graham's did either, by the way. Oh, you know, sure. Because I mean, Martin's book is, is incredibly valuable and detailed as well. Uh, so, sure. you know, I was not going to, in any way, it had already been done, you know. Uh, right. I had to find a whole other way of approaching the Twilight Zone. Mm -hmm. And it's it's really complimentary. I think, you know, the the Zickery book and the Graham's book, you know, they're very nuts and bolts. You know, when did this episode air? Who was in it? Who directed it? Um, and there's also critiques of episodes, uh, more in Mark's book, Zickery's book yeah, than Graham's books. Um, and interestingly, in the Z Zickery book, it's not always positive, um, you know. And one thing I noticed about your book is that you really don't badmouth any of the episodes that you cover. I think the closest you get is you say that you've never been crazy about time enough at last, but that's really and not even bad that enough, is, is, is through the, the, the filter of the, the moral code of the twilight zone. Right. Um, and, 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 and actually, no, I am crazy about time enough at last. I, I have a problem with it. Uh -huh. uh, you know, and that, that you, you, this, the, the, the story is told in the book about uh, a group of us being at, at uh, dinner and we were celebrating a, a, a friend's birthday in uh, Studio City, um, and we wanted to keep the night going. So we went. Uh, we walked across the street, uh, across Ventura Boulevard, to, to Dupar's restaurant, mm -hmm. and to get uh, coffee and pie. And uh, we felt that talking about the Twilight Zone, and everybody was just. We sooner or later, somebody brought up time enough at last, and everybody got rapturous. Ooh, you know, the, the <laughs> broken glasses, and you know. And I was silent. I was quiet. And finally, you know, uh, well, what's the matter? Don't you like that episode? I don't like, oh, no, I like that episode. There's a lot of love about that episode. How can you not like Burgess Meredith's performance? How can you not like the way it is shot? How can, how can you? It, and it has one of the, it, probably the most iconic images, visual images from the Twilight Zone. All of that is just immense. However... <laughs> There is, you know, a certain overriding morality to the Twilight Zone that you are paid in kind for what you bring into the Twilight Zone. So if you bring in hatred, bigotry, prejudice, you're going to take it in the shorts in the Twilight Zone. And if you take in good things in the Twilight Zone, by and large, you're going to be rewarded for it. Or at least get a happy ending. Mm -hmm. It's like the couple in Little Girl Lost. Mm -hmm. They didn't do anything wrong. They loved their daughter, and the love of their daughter is going to be rewarded oh. at the end of the episode. Well, the fellow that Burgess Meredith plays in Time Enough Last, he didn't do anything wrong. He's not the villain of the piece. The villain of the piece are the people, his wife, his boss. These are terrible people. Uh -huh. You know, people always go to those glasses being broken. That's not the most horrible moment in Time Enough Last. <laughs> <laughs> the most awful moment is when his wife gives him the book. Mm. This shrewish, awful wife who, who, who does not understand his love of reading and literature and poetry. And she gives him the book and says, read to me. And he thinks, oh, at last. She, she, has, she has come around. She understands. And he opens the book and she has defaced every page. Mm -hmm. So the words can't be read. That is one of the single most awful and cruel moments in all five seasons of the. It doesn't get much worse than that. All right. And what is this man's awful crime? He wants to read. Well, how <laughs> dare he? And if you look at what's happened with literacy rates and literature and books and libraries since that episode aired. The message of that episode kind of gets harder and harder to swallow so, since it. So that doesn't mean I don't like the episode. Uh -huh. 
I had to apply a lesson to that episode. And the lesson that I applied, as you know, is it precisely what Burgess Meredith's character says when the glasses break. That isn't fair. Right. It isn't. We agree. As we watch it, we absolutely agree with him. It isn't fair. And that was my mother's favorite phrase. We were five kids, you know, in a rather boisterous house. There were disagreements. And whenever one of the kids would complain to my mother, that isn't fair. My mother's quick and constant comeback was nobody said life was fair. <laughs> I accept it. I don't have to like it. Mm -hmm. I didn't like it when my mother said it. And I don't like it in the twilight zone. So I think that is one where the payoff is not worthy of the recipient of the bolt of cosmic justice uh -huh. that is delivered right between the eyes and breaks his glasses. <laughs> so that's kind of my problem. I don't even want to call it a problem because it is the exception and it stands as the exception. Uh -huh. So there is a lesson that even in the Twilight Zone, Nobody said life was fair. Right. Now, I am I am a huge fan of the Twilight Zone, but there are episodes that I really don't like, and this this is a yeah. safe place. <laughs> it would be amazing if that weren't true. <laughs> uh, nobody's going to come after you with torches and pitchforks, but are there any episodes that you just do not like, uh, even hate? I don't know that I hate any episode of the Twilight Zone, but there are episodes which, you know, I, I think are, you know, you get late into the fifth season when they were mm -hmm. really running out of gas. Uh -huh. And they were, were repetitious, almost by the numbers. Uh, Come Wander With Me is 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 as, as odd and as, you know, bizarre an episode as they ever did. I, I still to this day don't know what it really is all about or what it means. <laughs> it's it, it, it's it's you know and yet for all of that as there's in even like the worst twilight zones um there is an eerie quality to come wander with me oh absolutely that you know is a little unnerving it almost is like a night gallery episode mm -hmm. more than it is a is a twilight zone so there are certainly episodes which i think are you know lesser twilight zone sure you know, much lesser Mm -hmm. Twilight Zone. I think Rod had a pretty good fix on it. Rod said, you know, that they did 156 episodes, and that about a third of them were were pretty pretty good. You know, a third of them were mediocre, and the other thirds were were pretty much misses. You know, mm -hmm. or turkeys. You know, and I that's probably a little harsh, but you know, a 50 50 50 is not a bad breakdown. Sure. So, you know, I, I probably would, you know, if, if I was going to say, and I, and I, I, I speak to this in the, in the introduction of the book saying, I, I'm not speaking to the quality of, of the episodes. I am, I am talking about lessons. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that these are the best episodes. I'm saying that these are the ones from which I derived the lessons. Um, but there are clearly episodes which are at the top of the list, and there are clearly episodes um, which go, you know, I, well-intentioned episodes, some, some like, you know, I, I, I Am the Night, Color Me Dark, you know, uh -huh. a very well-intentioned episode, not very good, <laughs> not very, very heavy-handed. Yeah. Um, and, and certainly, you know, you agree with the message completely. Sure. But, you know, certainly not, 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 not a, not a very good episode. But, um, and then on the, on the flip side, there are episodes which you're always like, like the, the monsters are doing Maple Street. That are always going to stand very, very high uh -huh. in, in the lexicon. So, um, you know, there, there's a lot of levels of disagreement um, I, I, I among fans of the Twilight Zone, and I think that's part of the fun of it. Sure. And there's always going to be, you know, I, 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 are you at all from Craig? Are you at all familiar with Columbo? Um, you know, I remember seeing it as a kid. All right. There is an episode of Columbo in the original ones, the original 45 Mysteries, which are, you, you know, fans are always referred to as the classic mm. Columbo. There was one episode that Patrick McGowan directed mm. called Last Salute to the Commodore. 
And it is the oddest episode they ever did. It's quirky as all get out. It runs against the formula that the Columbo uh, show created. Mm -hmm. It is different from the other 44. You know, I, I love the episode. Mm -hmm. I love it because it is different. Mm -hmm. The fans, by and large, hate that episode <laughs> because it's different. Mm -hmm. You know, now Dick Levinson and Bill Link, who created the, the, the character, loved that episode. Uh, Peter Falk loved that episode. I love that episode, but the fans, it, and I think they're a little bemused with me. Um, but the fact that I like it so much, mm -hmm. I think they, they're, they're they, but they, they like all the stuff that I've done on Columbo, but I think it's sort of like, I'm the unfortunate uncle. It's just too bad. He has to like that episode, <laughs> you know? Uh, so I, I think with, with, with Twilight Zone, you, you get some of that, sure. you know, you, you, you always have this with, with everybody else because there are always episodes that you like. Uh, and sometimes it, it has to do with when you discovered it. Mm. or you know like I, one of my favorite twilight zone episodes is almost nobody's favorite twilight zone episode and it's a late episode and but it's one of the first ones i ever saw and i thought it was pretty scary and that's ring a ding girl oh okay and now it's almost no i don't think it would have come up on anybody's top 10 list mm -mm. and it's has always been a particular favorite of mine and i and i, and I love the you know the lesson that i derive from it that's in the book i'm, I'm very fond of um, but that episode hit me right between the eyes at the right age, and it has it is it has remained. So it's and like twenty two, twenty two. I, I say in the book, if I had to pick the two episodes that I found the scariest, mm -hmm. and that's a real Rorschach question, sure. because the, you know there's nothing more individual than what makes you laugh and what makes you scream in terror. You can't fake them. Mm -hmm. The two things, humor and horror, they're flip sides of the same coin, and they are individual. If you ask any, if you ask ten people, what's the scariest movie you ever saw, you'd get ten different answers. Mm -hmm. If you, you know, ask them what, what the funniest movie you ever they ever saw, you get ten different answers. So, if you look at the Twilight Zone, and there's a lot of ways to look at it, there's a lot of filters to look at it. But, you know, one of the ones is, you know, like, which, which ones scared you the most? Mm -hmm. which, which episode? I'm not saying which one did you think was the best episode. I'm not saying which one did you think had the most profound message, which was the height of its art. I'm saying which episode got to you? Mm -hmm. Which episode really unnerved you? Well, the two that did it for me at, the, at a young age was two and, and ring a ding and that answer is not going to change. You know, that answer is not going to change. And I don't think it, it, it would be anybody else's answer. I'm not expecting it to be anybody else's sure. answer. You know, um, I always like hearing what other people would say. You mm -hmm. know, I would, I would love to have a room of Twilight Zone fans that ask that question mm -hmm. in that way. You know. Um, and I would want to record that for the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's, a, that's a, a wonderful discussion because, again, it's individual. It, right. it, it, it's it's deeply deeply individual um you know uh, mark's book on the twilight zone you know he, there there are episodes that he doesn't he didn't think that rod could write humor mm -hmm. uh very well he thought that was kind of rod's achilles heel mm -hmm. um and um i know he's not uh, that crazy about the the, the ventures in the comedy on, on the Twilight Zone. Mm -hmm. um, I was. I, I, I think so, the, the ventures into comedy are charming. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I like, you know, Showdown with Ransom McGrew. Mm, sure. You know, I like it. I think it's a fun episode. I can watch it again and again and again and, and, and get, and get it, get it, get a charge out of it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I certainly like Mr. Garrity in the Graves. I oh, think sure. It's, you know, one of their, 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 their the, the, the comedies that really work. I like um, uh, Richard Matheson's Time Travel, the one with Buster Keaton. Uh, Once Upon a Time. Once Upon a Time, thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I think that's a, a lovely episode. Uh, so, you know, but I know that there will be people who, who don't think that the comedy episodes work, mm -hmm. you know. Well, you know I, I always like Mr. Beavis. 
You know, I, I know that there are people who don't like that episode. <laughs> um, but I always thought that that was a delightful episode. Mm-hmm. Um, successful than say Cavender is coming. Um, in, 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 in following the same ground, the same mm-hmm. territory. So, yeah, I mean, the, I, I guess I would say there are episodes if, if I was going to put on my top 10 list that I think go very, very high. But yeah, I'd have a bottom 10 list too, you know. Sure. Um, it, it doesn't mean that I you know, uh, stop over in a small town, you know, mm-hmm. it's not my favorite episode. It's it's repetitive. It seems like I've seen it before, basically because you kind of have. You kind of have, yeah. <laughs> you know, so I mean, I think there are there is lesser Twilight Zone, and that's a lot of that is gets bunched up into those those episodes in that fifth season, and yeah. and, and and you can almost feel them running out of gas mm-hmm. at, at the end of that 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 fifth season. Um, you know, but but you know, somebody mentioned the other day about you know they they kind of wrote off the whole fifth season, forgetting how many really good episodes are in the fifth season. Oh, oh, yeah. Because, well, I say, well, Nightmare at 20,000 Feet, Steel, Night Call. Some of Richard Matheson's best scripts are in the fifth season. Sure. You know, in praise of Pip. Mm, yeah. Um, there's, 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 there are some tremendous episodes in the fifth season. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Um, Mark, some of uh, Serling's themes, compassion for one's fellow man, the evils of prejudice and racism, avarice and greed. Those aren't only relevant today. They form what I consider to almost be a blueprint for saving the human race. If we would all just shut up and listen. I don't want to get political here, but if you could pick one Serling lesson to prescribe the world right now, which would it be? I'll go in with the monsters. As much as I love the obsolete man. Mm Mm-hmm. And the Obsolete Man is one of my favorite episodes. You know, you talk about a Burgess Meredith episode where I think that is increased in resonance. Sure. Uh, it's that one. Absolutely. But I'm going to go with the monsters are doing what he says. If we can't figure out how to exist together, we ain't going to exist. Uh-huh. Um, I, I think the monsters are doing Maple Street is the one that has grown in resonance the most as we've become more divided as a nation. Mm-hmm. I mean, Rod was clearly writing about the McCarthy era. He was, right. he was, that, that was his, his parable about divisions from fear and suspicion. And it, it, it all comes out of the Red Scare. Right. But that episode has increased in resonance for the entire nation on all levels, as we've become more divided on all levels. Mm -hmm. And I think if I was going to probably um, take out one lesson and and, and say everybody in America is going to be forced to watch this episode, they have to watch this episode. Even my daughter. It would be the monsters are due on Maple Street because there is, you know, there are several very profound lessons that the monsters are due on Maple Street but not the least of which is, you know, in the book, I, I, I quote the uh, the line by the historian Arthur Schlesinger, who says that, you know, uh, the motto of the country is e pluribus unum, which means out of many, one. And the original meaning of e pluribus unum was the 13 colonies, the 13 original states, and out of many states formed one sovereign nation, mm-hmm. out of many, one. But as we moved into the 1800s, and wave after wave of immigrant group passed the Statue of Liberty, welcoming the huddled masses yearning to breathe free. The idea of e pluribus unum changed, and it became out of many cultures, out of many beliefs, out of many ethnic groups. Out of all of these, we became stronger as one. We became stronger because of diversity. We became stronger because of the gifts that were brought. And Arthur Schlesinger famously said, as we became more divided, what this country needs is a whole lot less pluribus and a whole lot more unum. <laughs> and that's the message of the Monsters are Two on Maple Street. And the other message is something which just happens a lot. It happens on the internet. It happens in politics. It happens in social media. And that is, 
people are so intent on looking for monsters. And the people who are so intent on looking at monsters often enough turn into the monsters themselves. And that is the message of the monsters are due on Maple Street. So as much as I love the mass, as much as I love the obsolete man, uh, as certainly as much as I love uh, walking distance, mm. I would have to put the monsters are doing Maple Street as the one most people need to hear yeah. uh, today. Um, you indicate in the foreword of your book uh, that the Twilight Zone offers more lessons than your book covers. Right. So, should we expect a sequel? <laughs> Well, that's not up to me. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, there are no plans. I mean, there's mm-hmm. certainly no plans. And, and you know, it's, 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 it's sort of like, you know, when I wrote the Columbo book, I wrote it thinking um, I wanted to do, A, it was my second favorite series. But B, I wanted to address it because I thought that this was – one of television's two great contributions to the mystery field mm. that television had created two characters, two detective characters who could stand with the great detective characters of literature or movies. Mm-hmm. One was Rockford. Right. And I felt with this book that I was published in 1989, that this would be the first word on Columbo. There are, there are, Dozens upon dozens of books about Sherlock Holmes, oh. addressing Sherlock Holmes from every possible avenue. Oh. I, mean, I never expected Columbo to inspire the same kind of following, but I certainly thought that there was room for a couple of more books looking at a mystery that was that complex and was that important. In other words, I thought it was going to be the first word. I never expected it was going to be the last word. Yeah. And I knew it took until about last year, a new book on Columbo was published by a writer named Sheldon Katz. Mm-hmm. And in fact, I wrote the foreword to it. Yeah. I was so delighted to see it because I've been waiting all this time for somebody else to pick up the torch or, or the cigar, if you will, in the case of Columbo, <laughs> and run with it. Mm-hmm. And nobody... You know, since 1989, until Sheldon's book, nobody appeared to do this, you know. So, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, The Twilight Zone is like any other great work of art. There's so many ways to look at it. And, and I hope somebody takes up the torch and looks at it in another way or finds another way of looking at it and addressing it and studying it. Um, because I think that that's what great art is. It's, it's you, there's 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 endless ways to look at it and analyze it and, and, and grow an appreciation out of it. If there isn't, then the twilight zone is less than we think it is. Mm. And I happen to think it's more. Sure. So, Agreed. you know, uh, yeah, I, I, if, if this book were, you know, a, a runaway bestseller and they came back to me and said, you know, we want to do, you know, a, a son of everything I need to know. I learned that, <laughs> You know, would you be interested? You know, I suppose I would have to give in to popular demand. Uh, but you know, as I said before, I don't like repeating myself. Sure, it's, it's not my favorite thing in the world. Um, so, you know, I, 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 again, again, the next book's going to be on Theodore Roosevelt. So, you know, it's, this is about as far removed from almost anything I've done before, except that I was an American history minor in college and I've always been fascinated with the progressive era and Roosevelt in, in particular. So, you know, this, this is no surprise to anybody who knows me, but it certainly is a surprise to anybody who's looking at the resume and is expecting maybe the next book will be something about television or something about something in the genre field, you know, but I'll get to it, you know, because I'm, I, like I said, I'm always drawn back to something and, uh, you know, and I've been kicking around a lot of ideas on on different books and i always do but um you know but i certainly haven't been thinking of a sequel you know (laughs) to be honest with you you know sure i'll I'll be really happy if this one sells yeah well i i bought one so (laughs) thank you i've done my part 
it's just, it's just, you can't hear anything better than that, you know. <laughs> Well, Mark, I want to thank you for uh, taking the time to talk to us. Um, again, listeners, uh, if you have not yet picked up this book, Everything I Need to Know I Learned in the Twilight Zone by Mark DeWidziak, I highly recommend it. Uh, it definitely gets the Between Light and Shadow seal of approval. Uh, it's a great book. It's fun to read, and it stays with you. I mean, it's it's now been several weeks since I put it down, um, and it's still in my head. I, I'm still kind of reflecting back on it, and that's... I think another mark of, of greatness, you know, it's, you know, I didn't read it and forget it. And I think a lot of books, maybe recent books I've read, I tend to forget them. This one, I'm, uh, uh, it stuck with me. So I want to thank you for the book. Well, you know, I, I remember once when, uh, uh, when I was living in East Tennessee, I, one of the things I, I had to cover was, uh, country music mm. and, uh, you know, it was an exciting time. You know, you got to meet some some pretty uh, impressive people like Johnny Cash and oh, you know, wow. uh, people like that and Marty Robbins and some some really, you know, people I loved listening to mm-hmm. back then. But I remember interviewing, of all people, the, the, the Statler brothers. Mm-hmm. And I asked them a question about their 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 particular style, which you know, their style was very influenced by gospel music, barbershop, traditional harmony line singing, you know, a little bit of, a lot of things. And I remember asking them about their style and their bass. Um, Harold said to me, you know, he said, it's a good question, but our style is basically doing the best we can do. (laughs) And I thought that's a great answer. (laughs) That is a really great answer. And I've borrowed it. I've stolen that answer many, many times. (laughs) Which is, you know, I, 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 I really appreciate the compliment, and it really does touch you to the heart. Um, but but I can, I can honestly say that, that, you know, this is the best I can do, mm-hmm. you know, and that is my style, is doing the best I can do. So this is, you know, one of the lessons of the Twilight Zone is, you know, uh, never give up on the things which which fire you up. It's sort of the, the, the lesson from A Passage for Trump, which is another one of my favorite mm, episodes. Yeah. Me too. Don't give up on those things which, uh, which, which, which supply the magic in your life, mm-hmm. you know. And I have to say, the Twilight Zone ranks very, very high on supplying magic in my life. So, you know, as much as this has been, you know, when, when people tell me that how much they the, the book has been a gift to them, it has been a gift for me. That's good. So, you know, I, I, I'm I'm a very, very fortunate guy. And the reason I'm a very, very fortunate guy, Craig, is because I know it. Yeah. All right. I think that's a great place to leave off. <laughs> so, again, Mark, thanks a lot for your time. And, oh, thank um, you. No, really. I mean, you've spent a lot of time talking about, about, about a, my book. Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right. Take care, Mark. Okay. Thanks. You too, Craig. All thanks. Right. Mark's book, Everything I Need to Know I Learned in the Twilight Zone, A Fifth Dimension Guide to Life, is available everywhere fine books are sold. I will put a couple of links in the show notes. Um, That was great. Uh, That was very fun. Mark is very engaging. um, And that hour and a half just flew by for me. And I imagine it flew by for you as well. Uh, Next week... We will be returning to our normal episode analysis format, and as a special nod to Mark, uh, we will be covering The Monsters Are Due on Maple Street. So come back for that. Until then, kids, play nice. Between light and shadow.